This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. And now we're going to start the uh, formal part of the program, and it is my great pleasure to tonight introduce the Director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the Vice Chancellor for Marine Science here at UC San Diego. And without further ado, here is Tony Hamant. He is a very distinguished chemist as well as administrator. Welcome, everyone. My name is Tony Hamid. I am the director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and it's a great pleasure for you to welcome you, for me to welcome you to my favorite night of the year, and that's a celebration of both our graduate students and your generosity. Many of the people in the audience here have been supporting our students, this aquarium and Scripps, for a very long time. Um, tonight, you're being treated to the science of our students, the future leaders in science and society. It's our amazing students that keep this 107-year-old institution at the cutting edge of ocean and earth science and atmospheres. We do have oceanography in the name, and we're very proud of our aquarium. But most of you know we study everything from earthquakes all the way through to carbon soot and particles in the atmosphere. Some of my colleagues like to tease me and say that all we do is study earthquakes and tsunamis and severe storms and hurricanes. In fact, anything bad can happen to you. Scripps studies it. <laughs> but I, I take that as a badge of honor. We are trying to understand the future and prepare our community for what's coming for us. So I'd like to thank you for coming and now introduce Scripps Deputy Director for Education and Chair of the Department, Doug Bennett, who's going to introduce the three students to you. Welcome, Doug. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, and, and welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Jeffrey B. Graham Lecture Series on Ocean Sciences. And you've all seen the posters, or I, I hope you have, at least most of them. And now we're going to start with the student presentations. We have three student presentations, each lasting for just 15 minutes. So the, they'll be brief, so stay, stay tuned. Um, the, we're going to start off with Liz Johnstone. Liz is a fifth year geology student working at Scripps with Neil Driscoll. She studies sediment distribution patterns on the Gulf of Papua Shelf and cliff erosion in Southern California. Liz has been a wire fellow and she currently teaches science to high school students in San Diego as part of the NSF GK through 12 program, one of our major training grants. After she completes her PhD degree this summer, she plans on remaining at Scripps to do postdoctoral work. Liz, right. welcome. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. I think I speak on behalf of all the other Scripps fellows here in saying that we're all extremely excited to share our research with you tonight and acknowledge that Science of this caliber would not be possible without the support and generosity of many of you in this audience. And in particular, I'd like to thank Pooh Wire, who has directly supported um, my work here at Scripps and some of the work that I'll show you now. In our laboratory here at Scripps, we study sediments. And as my advisor loves to say, the sediment layers are the time clock of Earth's processes. And that's true because as mountains up in the high terrain erode, the sediments are transported down river and they're either deposited on land or the rivers bring them to the near shore shelf zone. And sometimes these sediments are deposited in canyons or bypass this system 
and go further offshore. Our group specializes in imaging these sediments using geophysical techniques. And somebody was talking to me about, uh, about my poster earlier and asking what type of geophysical techniques. And we use sound. So we use acoustic pulses that penetrate through the seafloor. And they allow us to image the layers below the seafloor. By doing this, we can tease out the various natural processes that act on the sediments to, um, in the earth. So we can look at the changes in sediment supply over time, changes in climate, and changes in the, the regional and uh, global sea level. And it's really interesting because you get all these different patterns in the sediments. And by knowing what pattern is created uh, based on these different processes, you can figure out which, one, which uh, process is dominant and which one is subordinate. We all know that California is a very tectonically active place. Tectonics build up reliefs. They build mountains. And erosion breaks those mountains down. And as those mountains are broken down into different layers, the sediments are deposited in all these different layers. This is an example here. This is a little diagram just showing all the different layers that we have in San Diego County. As you can see, there's quite a few. And these are characterized based on the time that they were deposited and also the type of depositional environment that they were deposited in. Any of you can go to the beach, the beaches that we have here in San Diego that are backed with high sea cliffs, and you can see this for yourself. This is a picture of the southern end of Solana Beach, and you can see three distinct layers when you go to these beaches. On the very bottom, this is the Del Mar formation. And if you go and look at this formation, you'll see that it's got a, a greenish grayish hue to it. This is because it's an old lagoonal deposit. If you look at this layer, you, you'll see old oyster shells and different things that you would see today in any of the, the little lagoons that you drive through on the one. Just above the Del Mar formation is the Torrey Sandstone. This is a really dominant feature here in, in uh, Southern California. This is an ancient beach. So there's very little uh, organic material. And there's really neat patterns, if you look at this closely, that show the different tidal influences in this uh, deposition unit. Above the uh, Torrey sandstone is this rich chocolate brown uh, formation that's called the Bay Point. This formation is much younger. It's only 125,000 years old. That was deposited uh, during the time when our, the sea level was the last uh, sea level low stand. So this formation is actually really dark in color. And if you look at it closely, you'll see tiny little um, plant debris and a lot of organic material in that, in that deposit. Now we're going to step back and look at Torrey Pines State Park. This is a much more regional perspective. And these are images that I acquired from CaliforniaCoastline.org. Any one of you can get online to, on this website, and you can look at uh, pictures of our, of our um, coast from San Diego all the way up the whole coast of California. And what I did was I pieced these images together. These are all merged. And it allows you to see um, the different layers and how they interact with one another. So you can see where there's gullies that form and, and the different processes that act on these layers. In addition, you can also see small cliff failures here. Um, this is north at the uh, parking lot of the state park, and then moving southwards, the perspective that we're looking at here. And some of you may have been to the state park where the flat rock is at the end, at the southernmost end there. As part of my work here at Scripps, I developed um, with some colleagues a cliff erosion assessment program. And here is an animation flying in. This is Mount Soledad. Here's the canyons offshore. This is uh, multi-beam data. So this is off, the blues are offshore data. The greens are the land topography. Um, this program, we started back in 2006. And we've been doing a time series analysis of the, of the cliff erosion. 
And you guys can check this out at our website listed here. And afterwards, if, if you don't have time to write it down, I can tell you later. But here is a map view of our study area. And so where we're looking, we're here at Scripps right now, down in La Jolla. And two times a year, so semi-annually, we, we map the whole coastline from Scripps all the way up to Encinitas, which is a very labor-intensive process. Um, but we want to get the seasonal differences between the cliffs. So what you can see in these little orange circles, those are areas where we've had massive cliff failures. And these are sites that we're monitoring to see how the cliffs, um, how much material was liberated and then how that material um, is reworked over time because of the waves. So this is our um, instrument that we use for data collection. It's called LIDAR, which stands for Light Detection and Ranging. And as opposed to the seafloor mapping techniques that are acoustic, this is a light um, signal that's sent out with a 905 nanometer laser pulse. And it comes out of this instrument here. So this is our little computer right here. So just a little field PC that we use to collect the data. It's connected to the instrument with an ethernet cable. We have all of our data is georeferenced. So this is a GPS receiver that's used to georeference our information. This is the laser scanner. It's made by EyeSight and it collects 400 or 4,400 points per second. And that allows us to cover about a kilometer per hour. This is a, a highly resolved system and allows us to have 10 to, 5 to 10 centimeters resolution. We use a, uh, the California Virtual Reference Station as our base station that allows us to, to uh, georeference all of our data. And finally, we have super strong grad students because <laughs> all of this equipment here weighs well over 100 pounds and we haul it with this garden wagon through the soft sand. And so it's, it's uh, quite a task and it builds big muscles. So. I think I'm the strongest girl in the lab. <laughs> so the way this instrument works is it sends a laser pulse out of the uh, scanner at an 80 degree angle. And it bounces, the signal bounces off the cliff and then returns to the instrument. And that's, the data is then uh, processed through the computer and it stores a data point cloud. The head on this thing, which we call R2D2 after the Star Wars character, it rotates 360 degrees, which allows us to collect over 2 million data points in just over 10 minutes. So this is a lot of data that we're collecting. We have well over a terabyte of data. So this is an image of Torrey Pines State Park. And it looks like a photograph. But in actuality, these are data points. These are, this is um, about 50 million data points. This is one day of uh, field work, survey field work. And this is a, a really good day. So we, we hauled the wagon all the way down to Flat Rock. And then each one of these little semicircles that you see is a spot where we stopped with the wagon and we took a scan. And we did a 180 degree scan. And then we marched 40 to 50 meters down the beach and did it again. And then with the georeferencing from this information, the GPS, we connect all these scans together and we merge them and create a 3D model of the clips. Here's a close-up image of, the, of a cliff failure in Torrey Pines. And you can kind of see the, the data points in here. But what's really neat is that this is all, um, uh, the data points are, are connected to the color data. So RGB color data is connected to the data points, which allows us to make it look like a photograph. And that helps us distinguish between the different layers in the processing and analyzing of the data. Here's a photograph of one of our large failures. And this is just for comparison. So you can see the difference between an actual photographic image and the data point. And what's really important about this study is that we know sea level is rising, 2 to 3 millimeters per year. And we, what we don't know is what effect this is going to have on our beaches and our coastline. And we, what we're creating here is a baseline. So the data that we're getting 
it has, we've been collecting it since 2006. And now we're having this really rainy year and end it with El Nino. So now we're going to find out what impact does this rainy, wet weather have on our cliffs. And we can take a few guesses, but this enables us to quantify the information. So what we do is, this is a photograph. This is before a failure in Torrey Pines. And then over time, this was back in 2006, uh, almost 80 cubic meters was liberated from the cliff. Orange is erosion and blue is accretion. So what you see here is a big chunk of the cliff fell to the, fell to the beach. And then a few months later, another big chunk fell. And then a few months later, a huge chunk fell. And that's a lot of material, 445 cubic meters. And this is all because of uh, a process called wave cut erosion. So this is from the waves coming up here during an extreme high tide and possibly a big storm event and hitting this cliff and just pounding it and eating away at it. And then eventually it just collapsed. It collapsed under all the um, energy. And then this failure just propagated up the cliff face and created some interesting patterns. This is another process of uh, cliff erosion. This is higher up on the cliff. And this type of erosion is from wind and meteor meteoric water dissolution through the cliffs. So what happens when you, is when you get uh, groundwater and it works its way through the sediments, it can hit a layer, um, usually like a clay layer that's less penetrable, and it comes out and it uh, destabilizes the cliff above it. And it sort of nucleates at that, at that same place and then works its way up the cliff and destabilizes. So here are two examples of um, other failures in the Torrey Pines region. And in this image, this LIDAR image, you can actually see the big piles of sediment. So this is a close-up of the TP7 site that I just showed you. And during my time as a graduate student and working on this study, I started to notice some interesting patterns in the, in the cliff erosion data. I noticed that as soon as a cliff fail, there was a cliff failure, the uh, smoothness of the cliff was reset. So the surface roughness plays a role in the um, stability of the cliffs. And I applied some statistical analysis to get RMS values, which essentially just measures the surface roughness. And as you can see, before the failure, this area was really rough. And then afterwards, it was just smooth. It was reset, which probably makes it a little bit more stable. So what I'm hoping to do with my thesis is come up with a, a classification index that's more regional in scale that I can say, um, this area has this type of surface rough, roughness. And maybe there's some kind of predictability index that can, be, that can come from this. But this is the preliminary stages. And um, I, this is a time series that just started a few years ago. And so I'm hoping to continue this time series as a postdoc here at Scripps and um, continue this work. And hopefully, we'll see more patterns with longer term data collection. In addition, um, I'm hoping to set up an international uh, research program in Indonesia. And this is. Nearby, this is Papua New Guinea, so I've done a bunch of work here looking at sediments. And I'm hoping to extend my study area and look at some of the sediments here in Chandrawasi Bay. This is a pretty isolated bay area, and I'm hoping to pick up some climate signals. And this is a really interesting area um, scientifically because it's so pristine here. So Southern California is very um, populated with humans. There's a lot of anthropogenic influence on everything that goes on here. But this area, there's very low human population. And there's a, a university here in Manikwari that's called the University of Papua. And a colleague of, of mine in uh, biological oceanography and, um, and I are trying to set up this program to create an educational outreach program that involves research as well. So what we want to do is give back to 
an underdeveloped nation and try to help people and teach them in the same ways that I've been able to learn here at Scripps. I've had access to some of the best technology available and I want to extend that to underprivileged um, youngsters and uh, the researchers in this area and see if we can work together and create a long-term sustainable program that uh, can help encourage academic development but also then work to um, increase the conservation efforts in this area because this area is so pristine. And really my goal is to uh, pay it forward. I, I love helping kids and I want to go to a place where um, there's really underprivileged kids and hopefully expose them to technologies that I've been exposed to and give them a better chance on this planet to um, be able to preserve the valuable resources that are in their own backyard. With that, I'd like to give a special acknowledgement to Pooh Wire, who has supported me, as I said before. My very excellent advisor, Neil Driscoll, who supported me through the years. My colleagues, Michael Olson and Jessica Raymond, who have been great in the field and processing data. And last but not least, California Sea Grant um, funded the establishment of our beach erosion or cliff erosion um, monitoring program. And so I'm very grateful to them. Okay, so we're going to go on to student number two now, and student number two is Grant Gallant. Grant uh, attended the University of Georgia for his undergraduate degree in marine ecology. After school, Grant spent a year teaching high school and two years in Belize, serving as a Peace Corps volunteer for the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef System Project. Grant is currently a third year marine biology student working with Phil Hastings on Gulf of California reef fishes and documenting Gulf-wide ecosystem change of the last several decades. Some of Grant's other experiences as a SIO student in the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation include a research fellowship in Washington, D.C. last spring and representation on the SIO delegation to Copenhagen for the UN Climate Talks last December. Grant has been supported by an IGERT fellowship from CMBC, that's the other major training grant that we have here at Scripps, uh, an IGERT fellowship from CMBC and the privately funded Link Family Foundation and Rosenblatt Fellowship. Grant. I'm excited to have this opportunity to speak with you for a few minutes tonight about the human ocean, a topic that interests me and about which I've learned a huge amount while studying, taking classes, and doing research down at Scripps. And you can see I'm also a big fan of the OR title because I never have to actually decide what to call a talk. So <clears throat> you'll hear about a few of these other topics as I, as I move along. I'd like to start by just thanking you and telling you a few things about myself. Um, thank you for being here tonight and thank you for supporting Scripps students. I have benefited in a huge way from private philanthropy in this room and from this community in general. Um, formally, I'm a conservation biologist. I work in the Gulf of California and study small fishes like this little blenny right here. And as some of you might know, conservation biology or conservation in general is not high on the priority list for federal and state funding agencies. And without private funders and private philanthropy like yours, we just wouldn't be able to do our work. And that's why a lot of the posters that you saw in the other room involved conservation. Also, furthermore, as a fish biologist, I work in the fish collection down at Scripps. And Scripps oceanographic collections in the world, and in general, are some of the best in the world and have benefited in a big way from pri private philanthropy. And like Doug said, I'm the Rosenblatt Fellow, which means I'm sort of assistant manager of the fish collection and that's exclusively funded by private support. And finally, also, as Doug mentioned, I was um, afforded the opportunity to go uh, to Copenhagen as part of the Scripps delegation to the UN Climate Conference, and that was um, supported entirely, my part of it, um, by Dr. Ellen Lehman. So it was that, that's what I'm going to mostly talk about, that last part right there. It was that um, experience that I had in DC last, last year 
and, and Copenhagen last December that got me thinking of this idea of the human ocean, how people, climate, and the ocean are all connected. And very intricately, you can't separate them, and um, each one affects the others and depends on the others. And I, I was sort of was struck by how people, very intelligent people in Copenhagen that deal exclusively all the time with climate sort of forgot about this part right here, the ocean. And a lot of them even forgot about this part here, people, which is interesting. Um, the marine science community knows that these are all linked, and the conservation community does, and the human rights com community does. But it struck me that the general public sometimes doesn't. And the people that we elect to go represent us at places like Copenhagen also don't. And really, that's, that's my fault. I, I haven't done a good enough job educating people about this triangle. We haven't done a good enough job. So that sort of inspired me to put together this talk. And when you think of all the ways that these three things are connected and you just sort of throw them onto one PowerPoint slide and a giant spider web of a figure, it looks like this. <laughs> um, and that's, that's a lot to deal with, so we'll just concentrate on these main areas here. People increase atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, and that changes the climate. Um, the climate and the ocean regulate each other, and changes to one affects the other. People, through totally different activities, alter biodiversity and habitat in the marine ecosystem, which uh, weakens the ocean and therefore threatens ocean ecosystem services on which we rely. And that threat threatens people. And that's the big one, right? We, that's what we care about. We're people. We care about people. I care about me. I'm a person. Um, and so that's sort of what this is all about, and that's what we need to remember as we're studying, studying this topic. So now I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to step through each of these, um, each of these areas um, and, and explain in a little more detail, starting with the first one. People increase atmospheric greenhouse um, gas concentrations in several ways, including burning fossil fuels for transportation, for industry, for shipping, for <coughs> electricity generation. We're creatures of comfort. We like to be comfortable. We always like to be at about the same temperature. We like the idea of taking resources from a place like Africa, moving them to China to make things, and use, using those things in Texas. We're, we like to be comfortable. And that, comfortable, that comfortableness comes at a cost of burning fossil fuels and altering climate. We also like to change the landscapes around us to better suit our needs. That makes sense. Again, we like to be comfortable. And those land use changes increase concentrations further. And finally, we're currently constrained to a process of cement production that releases an, um, a huge amount of, of greenhouse gases and, and changes this problem, or makes this problem even more significant. And this has all been shown empirically here at Scripps by uh, Dr. Charles Keeling and the Keeling Curve. And of course, as a Scripps student, I'm legally bound to mention this tonight. Um, <laughs> but you can see very clearly that over the last 50 years, Greenhouse gas concentration has gone up. And what Dr. Keeling also demonstrated, and to much less press, is very clearly using intricate, intric intricate chemistry that none of us really understand, um, this is a, a people problem. You can tell the CO2 in the atmosphere that comes from people and how it's different than the CO2 in, in the atmosphere that was already there or that comes from volcanoes or plants, for example. So a moment ago, I told you that ocean and climate regulate each other and changes to one and affect the other. That's not exactly true. Um, it's sort of like when you're growing up and you learn something cool in science class, and the next year your teacher said, well, that wasn't totally true, but now I'll explain. And then the next year they said, well, that wasn't totally true, but now I'll, now I'll explain. Well, as Doug said, I was a high school biology teacher. So that's not exactly true, but now I'll explain. Um, the climate is a manifestation of all the physical, chemical, and oceanographic properties of Earth. The ocean is one part of that, a really big part. But really, the climate is a manifestation of ocean and atmosphere interactions. And these include things like air and water. There is no place on Earth where the surface of the ocean is not in contact with air. And things pass across that boundary and, and affecting each other. Also, ice 
liquid water and vapor, the three forms of the most important chemical or the most important compound to life on Earth are all found in both the ocean or the ocean and the atmosphere. The ocean is a giant buffer for the atmosphere. Anything we put out in the atmosphere eventually ends up in the ocean in some form. It's also the world's biggest heat pump. It takes huge amounts of hot water and air and pumps them towards the poles, and huge amounts of cold water and air and pumps it back towards the, towards the equator. Um, some of these things make places like Europe or New Zealand more habitable. And finally, monsoons and lo other local winds on which civilization is designed are directly um, an effect of the different properties between land, water, and the atmosphere. And so for this reason, climate change speaks to ocean change. Whenever we warm the atmosphere, we warm the ocean, threatening places like coral reefs or other intricate ecosystems. Or whenever we fill the atmosphere with CO2, that, that CO2 makes it into the ocean, acidifying the ocean and threatening marine food webs that are based on shell-building organisms. As I said earlier, people, through their other activities, affect the ocean. People, I like to say, are the most successful marine species. Um, now, we don't always live on the ocean, but there's no doubt that we are the best marine predator. Through fishing and hunting, we have fundamentally altered the ocean. We have taken out 90% of the large, large fish. Currently, 80% of marine fisheries are fully exploited, overexploited, or completely collapsed. Um, some, using hunting, we, we definitely drove some species of marine mammals to extinction. They're never coming back. We are really good at hunting in the ocean. We've also polluted the ocean, and it's, it's not just trash and, and plastic like you see here, but it's also dangerous chemicals, and all of these things threaten marine biodiversity. We also have fundamentally changed the marine habitats through destructive fishing, for example, which not only takes a resource, but prevents it from, from rebuilding, or from irresponsible coastal development um, that threatens our mangrove forests and seagrass beds and, and sand dunes. 50% of mangroves have been lost. 50% of seagrass beds have been lost in just the last 15 years. And marine pollution, resource prospecting, and so on and so on are other ways that we're um, using the ocean and, and succeeding. But like I said, this threatens the ecosystem services on which we rely. We need the ocean. The ocean is very important to us. It feeds us. Two, two billion people around the world get at least 15% of their calories from the ocean and 400 million get more than half. On some small islands and Arctic communities, it's 100% of their calories come from the ocean. The ocean feeds us. It also employs us, 8% of the world. I couldn't believe this. 8% of the world population is employed or a dependent of someone who is employed by the fishing and aquaculture industries. And while 8% doesn't sound like a huge amount, that's almost 700 million people. That's a lot of work. The ocean healthy marine ecosystems also support, support us uh, through shore protection. Uh, mangrove forests, again, coral reefs, sand dunes, all of these ecosystems do a better job and a much less expensive job of keeping our sediments and protecting us from dangerous storms than something like this uh, physical infrastructure here. And to put this in scale for you, that is a two-lane road with cars going in both directions. This is a major, major um, undertaking. We also transport 90% of our trade goods on the ocean, and we just like the ocean. We just like knowing that it's out there. It's, it's fun, we surf there. It's uh, religious inspiration, it's cultural inspiration. We like the ocean, we get a lot of benefit from it. So when you take all of those things that I just talked about and add them up, you're back to this. Or this, or this. The ocean, the climate, and people, are intimately linked. So what can we do? Um, I'll quote Dr. Elke Weber from Columbia University who said, let's start with the fact that climate change is anthropogenic. If it's caused by human behavior, then the solution probably also lies in changing human behavior. So this is not a talk about climate change, but it's an interesting quote, and if you can replace these two words with anything from that last slide, overfishing, destructive fishing, irresponsible coastal development, you could leave it as climate change. These, um, these are all behavioral problems that require behavioral solutions. 
And I'm not one to stand up here and tell you what to do. Um, but I do know that change starts in the home. So I'll tell you a short little three-step rule that I try to follow every day to change my behavior. And it's act liberally, live conservatively, and play moderately. <laughs> um, I like to use my taxes and money and votes and whatever else to try to find solutions. I'm a liberal. I like to use my money responsibly, use my resources responsibly, reuse things whenever I can. I'm a conservative. And, well, I can't worry about this all the time, but if I play too much, I might, I might miss some possible solution. So I'm a moderate. And if I can't connect with every single person out there on this issue or find some common ground as a liberal, a conservative, and a moderate, <laughs> then my problem might just be bigger than global change. <laughs> so thank you very much again, and have a nice evening. We've quickly arrived to the, the last presentation this evening, and that will be by Ayana Johnson. Ayana is a fifth year marine biology PhD candidate advised by Dr. Jeremy Jackson. She was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Ayana obtained her Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Science and Public Policy from Harvard University. Before coming to Scripps, she worked for two years at the Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, D.C., where she helped to develop federal ocean policy. She is now an interdisciplinary fellow in the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. Her dissertation research takes a holistic approach to understanding how sustainability, uh, excuse me, how, how to sustainably manage fishing on coral reefs, incorporating ecology, economics, and sociology. Ayana. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for sticking around to hear my story. Um, as Doug mentioned, my dissertation is focused on sustainable management of fishing on coral reefs using the island of Curaçao in the Netherlands Antilles as a case study. Now, I never thought I would be doing this. I, mean, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. There's not really like a warm, friendly ocean there. I thought I was going to be an environmental lawyer. Um, but the ocean does have a very strong allure, I think, for a lot of the people in this room. And when I decided to pursue a PhD in marine biology, I surprised myself, but I did not surprise my mother, who produced the following photograph, proving my long-standing love of beautiful fish. Apparently, that was my favorite stuffed animal. Um, also, my, my father's from Jamaica, where he grew up fishing on the coral reefs there. And my mother's family is from Newfoundland, which also has a very strong fishing tradition. So um, it was all in the cards, apparently. I just didn't know it. <laughs> so here's the context for the rest of what I'm going to say. And it's that coral reefs around the world are, as a general rule, overfished. A lot of you may be familiar with the research that was done here in the past few years and is actually ongoing expeditions to the Line Islands. And those are islands about 1,000 miles south of Hawaii. And that's how far a marine biologist has to go in order to study a healthy coral reef these days. So I have actually never seen a healthy coral reef. And after three years of doing research, diving on some of the healthiest reefs that are left in the Caribbean, I really started to wonder how much fishing can a reef really handle. So on this side of the diagram, you'll see this is a schematic of a coral reef with very dense coral cover, very high biodiversity, and a lot of large organisms. And this is the trajectory of degradation towards very sparse and unhealthy corals and very few large organisms left. And that's the direction that we've been headed in for the past few hundred years, and that process has only accelerated with the um, population increase and development of our coasts. So let's put this in perspective a little bit. Why does this matter? Well, it's not just about the reefs. It's about human welfare. And as Grant mentioned, there are tens of millions of people who rely on the reefs for both their nutrition and their livelihoods. In fact, apparently I'm off by a factor of 10 here. So what we have is very simply a problem of too many people eating too many fish. 
There are clearly a lot of other factors affecting the health of coral reefs, but that's the one that I'm focusing on here today. So what we have here is a reef. This is actually a photograph taken in the Lion Islands, um, including sharks and beautiful, healthy, lush corals. And this is another also taken in the Lion Islands, but where there's a lot more coastal development, a lot more people, and you'll see that the reef is dominated by algae. The corals are sparse, and you don't see any large fish. So this is a common occurrence around the world right now. So my question is, how do we manage what is left? And it's important to remember that what we're managing is people, not fish. The fish are not doing anything wrong. <laughs> but in order to figure out what the people need to be doing, it's important to consider not only the science of a coral reef, but also the sociology and the economics. So my research is by necessity very interdisciplinary and my background in public policy and social sciences has been very valuable to me in trying to understand fishing on coral reefs. So um, I'm using the island of Curaçao right here as a case study. It's in the Netherlands Antilles between Aruba and Bonaire right off the coast of Venezuela. I've been going there every year for the past three years, spending two to five months out of the year there. So I feel like I've gotten a very good understanding of that place. Fishing on Curaçao right now is basically unregulated, which is problematic because when you let people do whatever they want to the ocean and they're relying on it for their incomes and for their nutrition, they're not always thinking about the future and thinking about conservation. So there are only about 50 full-time fishermen, but there are also about 250 part-time fishermen and a lot of recreational fishermen. And collectively, these people are taking about 12 tons of fish off the coral reefs there every year. So that's a lot of fish. Um, and the fisheries department is only one person and zero scientists. So I've sort of become the person who's helping to advise them what to do with their fishery and how to develop a management plan. So it seems like you should be able to keep track of 300 people on a small tropical island, but it's very complicated to understand the impacts of these fishermen on the reef because there are so many different species that are being harvested. There are many different boats that are landing their catch in many different ports, um, and there are no permits required for fishing on the island, so even the fisheries department doesn't know how many fishermen there are. Um, they were very happy to receive the estimates that I just put up on the previous slide. Um, and there are about six major different types of fishing gear that are being used from trolling, which is dragging a line behind a boat, uh, to uh, fishing with a, just a spool with fishing line on it, to fish traps, to spear guns, to beach seines where they round up schools of bait fish, to gill nets which hang vertically in the water and catch basically anything that swims into them and is too large to fit through. So what are your options for management in a place like this. And I should say Curaçao is not the exception. There are a lot of places that have more regulations in place, uh, but there are still many islands around the world where there's very little restriction on what you can take out of the ocean and what you can put into it. So the options for management include limiting the number of fishermen, limiting the quantity of fish that's removed from the ocean, banning the catch of certain species, establishing marine reserves where fishing is not prohibited, and regulating the types of fishing gear that can be used. So limiting the number of fishermen is culturally and politically infeasible on this island, and so I quickly ruled that out as one of the ways forward. Quotas, where you limit catch quantity, as well as the banning the catch of cert certain species, both require a lot of enforcement, which requires a lot of money, which means that that's not going to work here. Marine reserves are something that's currently being considered by the government, and that process is ongoing. Um, and I contribute to that where I can, but my research really focuses on the regulation of different types of fishing gear. Because basically, by regulating what types of fishing gear are used, you can regulate what is caught. And I've been focusing on fish traps and gill nets, and that's because those are the two types of fishing gear that are the least selective, so they catch all sorts of things, regardless of what's targeted, including juveniles and undesirable species, ornamental things like butterfly fish and sur surgeon fish. Basically, you're finding Nemo cute fish um, that no one really wants to eat. So the first project I did there involved a lot of uh, bungee cords 
and strapping fish traps onto this tourist boat and trying to figure out if there's a way to make trap fishing more sustainable. And that's an important project because two-thirds almost of the fish that are caught off the reefs in Curacao are caught using traps. So if there's a more sustainable way to do that, that would be a great improvement. And one potential way to do that is to use these vertical rectangular gaps in the corners of the trap that would allow your narrow-bodied fish to escape. And often the narrow-bodied ones are the ones fishermen aren't trying to catch. They're not like your meaty groupers and snappers. They're like your cute fish, your aquarium fish. Um, so escape gaps were proposed by the government there and actually were proposed in Bermuda and have been used in Bermuda. And yet after all of this, they have no scientific data on if they would work, how much, uh, how big the economic impact would be on fishermen, et cetera. So I decided this would be a great first project in graduate school, um, very straightforward. So I used four different types of traps that were handmade for me by a local fisherman. These are the traditional traps. This is what's usually used to regulate trap fisheries around the world, and that's regulating the size of the mesh that's used. It's basically chicken wire over a wooden frame. This is uh, a fish trap retrofitted with two uh, short escape gaps, 20 centimeters high each and two and a half centimeters wide. And this is a trap with tall escape gaps that span the entire height of the trap. So uh, this didn't work at all. I tested that and basically it didn't catch any fish, which is great support for fishermen's resistance to that approach to regulation. I can see why they wouldn't like to catch zero fish. Um, this is the proposed regulation, and I just decided to test this uh, additional type of escape gap to see if the height of the gap made a difference. So here are my results. Um, there are four different categories of fish that I uh, use to understand the results. For the high value fish, which are the groupers and snappers, you'll see on the y-axis the mean number of fish that were caught in each type of trap. The mean number of fish does not change for the groupers and snappers, because they're not getting out of these escape gaps anyway. However, you do see a significant reduction in the quantity of herbivores that are caught, and that is really fantastic news, because herbivores are very important eaters of algae on the reefs, and so they keep algae in check and let the corals be the dominant thing on the bottom. Because as you probably know, corals grow very slowly and algae can grow very quickly, so without these herbivores, to help the corals, the corals are kind of fighting a losing battle. So in addition to reducing herbivores, the escape gaps also reduce the catch of sochi, which is the local term for a mixed group of, mixed species group of reef fish that are sold at one price. So pictured here are the squirrel fish and the angel fish, and those tend to get out of the, the escape gaps, generally speaking. And most importantly, the bycatch, or the catch of completely undesirable species such as butterfly fish and damselfish, is reduced by about 80% when you put in these gaps. So basically, what you have is you can reduce the bycatch without reducing the value, so it's a rare opportunity to have a win-win situation for both fishermen and for conservation. And it costs about a dollar per trap to retrofit, so they don't need new traps. So uh, one of my goals is to get this uh, implemented everywhere that trap fishing is being undertaken. Um, however, this, uh, uh, before we get to the however, here's more good news. Um, so 7.4 fewer fish per trap. If you think about 100 traps fishing 100 days out of the year, that's already 74,000 fish that you don't need to catch. And if you scale that up, there are over 20,000 active fish traps in the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico alone, um, and many, many times that around the world. So we're talking about millions and millions of fish annually because it could be saved by something so simple as this. However, escape gaps do not solve all of the problems of sustainability that are associated with trap fishing. Um, most importantly, they're still ca the catch is still dominated by herbivores the parrotfish and surgeonfish, even though there is a significant reduction. Traps cause habitat damage as they're thrown over the sides of fishing boats and pulled back in. They also do nothing to save my favorite coral reef fish, which is the trunkfish, which is in cross-section triangular. So um, wide-bodied, low-value fish cannot escape through the gaps. 
Um, and ghost fishing is also a problem where lost or abandoned traps continue fishing um, and the fish is, are no longer harvested. So gaps alone cannot make fishing sustainable, but this is certainly a huge step in the right direction um, as far as the sustainability of this type of fish, fishery. So I've also been doing research, as I mentioned, on gill nets, which are these nets that hang vertically in the water. Um, and I'm not going to tell you too much about that because I don't really have much time. But basically the bycatch from that type of fishing is even higher. You catch endangered species. You're catching um, herbivores and uh, scorpion fish, which are not desirable for food. You're catching uh, juvenile lobsters and juveniles of other things. Uh, fish are rotting in the nets before they're harvested. And this is the only shark I've ever seen in 250 scuba dives on the island of Curacao. And it was a juvenile reef shark that was about this big and dead in the gill net. They also cause a lot of habitat damage as they get caught on the bottom on live coral. This is uh, one of my research assistants helping to uh, untangle this uh, net from the reef. Uh, the fishermen would have just ripped it up from the surface. So among the things that are unsustainable as far as fishing on coral reefs is the export of reef fish to the developed world. Here you see a beautiful rainbow-colored stoplight parrotfish in a gill net. And those parrotfish are increasingly getting packed up and shipped to places like this is a Whole Foods in Greenwich, Connecticut, where apparently parrotfish were temporarily for sale until they were alerted to how terrible this was. Um, parrotfish are also showing up at restaurants in San Diego. This is a local event that was publicized in Riviera Luxury Lifestyle magazine last year, which I happened to be flipping through on the internet while in Curacao. And uh, that inspired me to start a campaign about uh, educating Americans about the unsustainability of eating parrotfish. So more to come on that. I've actually been working with the Shifting Baselines uh, organization to develop a public service announcement that we're going to be uh, raising money to air in various uh, markets like uh, Florida and California and Hawaii where parrotfish are most commonly seen for sale. So the last bit of my research that I'm going to mention is interviewing fishermen. So all of this has been talking about problems, but what's really important is coming up with solutions. And solutions are only useful if they're practical. So what I've been trying to understand is what the fishing and diving communities um, on Curacao think about the health of the reefs and what should be done to protect them. So I'm only going to talk about my interviews with fishermen right now. I interviewed 126 fishermen last year asking each of them over 250 questions. So I talked with each of them for over an hour with a translator. Um, and this involved me driving around, opportunistically interviewing people in my trunk. I had folding chairs and a cooler full of beer. <laughs> and it turns out that was my most important research tool. Um, I was asking them questions about all sorts of things from the health of the reef, to their fishing practices, to what kind of management they would prefer, to how their catches have been changing over time. Um, and basically what they told me is, it's not like it used to be. This was the common refrain. And so here you can just see the percent of fishermen and then how they think that things have changed. And basically everybody thinks it's worse or much worse. So when you ask them what's causing this decline in catch, here's where it gets interesting. So is it pollution? So this is a percent of fishermen and then just yes or no, in case that's too small to see. So is it pollution? Uh, yes. Is it climate change? Yes. Is it changing currents? Yes. Is it development? Coastal development gets a, a marginal yes as well. But then you start asking questions about fishing. No, it's not fishing. It's not the use of small net, n mesh nets. It's not spear fishing. It's not our fault. <laughs> Whose fault is it? Uh, for the, I asked them these questions as yes or no, and then they were able to sort of volunteer anything else they thought was contributing to the declining catches. Commercial fishing offshore got a write-in of 41%. Boat noise, 10%. Overfishing of bait fish, 10%. And tourists using sunscreen, 9%. <laughs> Um, they think it really scares away the fish. So 
50% of fishermen think fishing is unprofitable, and yet they continue to do it, and they want their children to do it as well. And so when I ask them, it's so much worse in the past 10 years, what would make you stop fishing? Nothing. Or death were the most popular answers. 64% of people. This was not multiple choice. This is how much agreement there is. Um, too old. I actually had six people say only if they had no legs would they stop fishing. <laughs> it's not at all. Uh, only 9% of people said it had anything to do with whether or not it was profitable. Um, only 8% of people said it had anything to do with how many fish were left. <laughs> Jobs on land were lucrative uh, to the rare 7%. Um, and and God apparently has the ability to make 6% of the fishermen stop fishing. But really, nothing when I die. When the fish stop biting, and then I say, well, aren't the fish already not biting? And they say, yeah, what am I supposed to do, sit on land? When the sea gets dry, I don't know if we really have to save the earth. So nothing's going to make them stop fishing, which is why I ruled that out as the option before. So my research right now is focused on trying to tease apart these two things, what's hurting reef fishes and what's helping reef fishes, trying to augment this and decrease this. So as I said at the beginning, we have too many people eating too many fish, but at the same time, there's a westernization of the diet. Thanks to McDonald's, coral reef fish might be saved. Um, Gas and gear are becoming increasingly expensive, which is reducing uh, the amount of fishing people can afford to do as a hobby or as a part-time job. Uh, but at the same time, that's keeping people closer to shore, uh, where, where they're hammering the reefs more than the offshore pelagic fish, fish like tuna. The use of gill nets is growing, uh, but at the same time, it's becoming more and more difficult to get loans for boats and fishing gear. Uh, coastal development and pollution are becoming a problem. Uh, wastewater is often untreated, but at the same time, you have such rough conditions on the north shore of mo many islands that you have de facto protected areas. Um, and, and then lastly, there's a very long history of exploitation, especially in the Caribbean. Um, so there's, there's a lot of uh, intense exploitation that has been going on, uh, not just in the recent past, but um, for at least a few hundred years. But you also have a decrease in the number of people who are going into fishing, and that's partially because it's unprofitable, but it's not uh, being taken up by the next generation. So just to let you know where I'm going from here, uh, my next step is to go to Bonaire to conduct similar uh, interviews there. Um, that's going to be really interesting because Bonaire has had a marine protected area for 30 years, and they have a very strong ethic of conservation there. So comparing Curaçao, where there are no regulations, and Bonaire, where there are a lot and they are very well enforced, hopefully provide me some insight as to how to push Curaçao a little bit in the direction of their uh, next door neighbor. Um, I'm also, as I mentioned, doing this uh, campaign to raise awareness about parrotfish consumption. So don't eat any parrotfish. Um, sometime along the way, I'll write a dissertation and then move back to Washington, D.C. to do more policy work. So that's my plan, um, and all of this couldn't have been done without the huge support um, academically and financially of a large number of people, including my advisor, Jeremy Jackson. And in particular, um, I want to thank Russ and Eloise Duff, who are here in the audience, who have been incredibly generous supporters of my research throughout my entire time here, um, and also form formidable bocce opponents. So with that, I'll take any questions you have. Thank you very much.